It is 7 o'clock. Good evening, everyone. We will call the meeting to order. Um, are there any items to be added to the agenda by unanimous consent? Um, Deputy Board? I'd like to add on uh, just a discussion about grants. package, you did uh, have a copy of the minutes from the October 9th, 2018. Are there any... Oh, sorry. Yeah. So we need to uh, move the approval of the agenda as presented okay. with the items added. Moved by Deputy Warden Marshall. Second. Okay. Second by Councilor Martel. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carried. Review of the minutes. Um, so in your package, you did have a copy of the October 9th, 2018 meeting. Are there any any errors or omissions? I move the adoption. Oh. Oh. Oh, Is there something, uh, Brian? I didn't want? move in the discussion. Just, okay. Uh, I'm going to try to find it, but I didn't think that we... I didn't think that we had uh, put a number that evening of 10 for the students. So I thought the motion was not made. And I think it's listed here, yeah, on the last <coughs> page three. This is a cost to a maximum of 10 Cambridge University and University students. And right. I think we had a motion with the number that evening. I thought we sent an email. Okay. I made the motion. Okay. Okay. That evening? Yes. Because I thought the email went out the following day. Yeah, I, I do recall that we had asked the CAO to look into what the number might be. Yeah, do you remember that? Yeah, what yeah the number maximum? was, uh, they, they invited um, 17, but we only paid for 10. Okay, because I, I was talking to that night and we weren't sure what the number was, so I didn't think we had included that in the motion that evening. Okay, so we'll leave a question mark on that. Yeah, but I made the motion, uh, Gordon, and I think it was 10. The motion was for 10. <coughs> okay. Well, Yvonne, uh, Yvonne will we'll double check on that sure, just okay. to make sure. Yeah. Thank you. Anything else? Okay. Great. Uh, the uh, has been moved by Councillor Goyesh for the adoption of the minutes. So I have a seconder. Second. Seconded by Councillor Martel. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carried. Uh, presentations is next on the agenda. I will uh, make note to council that we do have an amendment there, just um, the Island Food Network. We did receive um, an email from the folks who were to come down to present to us this evening, and that will be postponed to a later date. So we do just have the one presentation tonight from our Seniors Take Action Coalition. So I will ask the ladies to please come up. Big one. So good evening, and uh, thanking. Uh, I want to thank you for allowing us uh, to share the Strait Richmond Area Seniors Take Action Coalition Housing Survey result with you this evening. So my name is Claire Doyle. I'm chairperson of the STAT Subcommittee on Housing. And to my right is Celeste Gotel, health promoter for the Nova Scotia Health Authority Eastern Zone. Celeste was instrumental in setting up the final uh, database collection for the survey. So she's with us this evening to present the findings. So the mission statement of our organization, known as STAT, is to um, assist support and advocate to ensure all senior issues and concerns are addressed. And in 2017, a few housing issues caught the attention of our group. 
and the coalition felt it was necessary to identify the housing needs of seniors. From there, uh, a subcommittee was um, put in place, and today uh, we are here, of course, to present the, the findings. So before I turn the mic over to Celeste, uh, I would like to take this opportunity to give an honorable mention to the housing subcommittee members who so generously gave of their time to make this happen. I would also like to thank the different community groups that worked with us and supported our work from start to finish. 262 people participated in the housing survey. Following the presentation, we'll be open to answer any questions you may have. So I'll turn this over to Celeste for the presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Claire. So I just wanted to um, share with you that um, the work that I'm doing with the Seniors Take Action Coalition around the Seniors Housing Survey is part of a larger piece of work that I'm doing around housing, generally speaking, in Richmond County in the Strait Area. Uh, recently, you would know that uh, we, co we partnered with Richmond County and the town of Port Hawkesbury to organize a think tank on housing. So this is kind of a piece of that work. Um, so I'm, I've, we've sent you all the report of the findings, so you've had an opportunity to look at this. So essentially what we're going to do today is just kind of um, highlight some of the key findings of the survey, and so that way you'll have a little bit more context. So as Claire mentioned, uh, there were 262 people that participated in the survey. And I wanted to just bring to your attention that it is Richmond County and the street and the town of Port Hawkesbury that was involved in, in uh, participating, but the majority of the respondents came from Richmond County. Um, I wanted to highlight just the, the census profile information just as a point of relevance to show that um, <coughs> As you all know, 46% of your population are over the age of 55, and we included 55 and over for the purposes of the survey. So uh, the majority of seniors that responded to the survey were women. Um, now, this is not a big surprise. Um, there were um, some men that participated, but because this survey was actually what's called a convenience survey and not a random survey. Essentially what this meant was that we just didn't uh, randomly call people to participate in the survey. We, we sought out places where seniors would be. And because a good number of the surveys were done uh, connecting to seniors clubs, uh, a lot more women joined seniors clubs than men. So as a result, you're going to have a higher uptake of, of women completing the survey. We also know that we have a higher population of women in this area as well so that also uh, contributes to it so the majority of people responding to the survey were 65 years of age and over again this is not surprising given that the majority of the respondents came from seniors clubs and from events where seniors would attend and most of those seniors tend to be older so that doesn't come as a surprise either either so this just gives you a bit of a profile of where the surveys came from. You'll see that I mentioned earlier that there were some people in the town of Port Hawkesbury that participated, and we will be also presenting to the uh, council there as well, uh, but that only represented 25. So the majority of the respondents were, in fact, from Richmond County, and you can just see kind of the pockets of areas where there was... Um, the numbers responding. There were 39 that were not specific. So what that means is they, they didn't identify when they completed the survey what community they were from, even though we did ask. Sometimes when you're doing surveys, as I'm sure you all appreciate it, not everybody always completes every single part of every question, even though you would like them to. And that's one of the disadvantages when you do a paper or an online survey as opposed to face-to-face -face where you can actually ask the person the question. So one of the questions we asked is how many people lived in their household. And you'll notice here that 141 uh, responded that said they lived with the spouse. But the part that I wanted to mention uh, that's kind of relevant and significant and of interest to you is the number of people that said that they lived alone. 
So while the majority of seniors do live with a spouse, there is a significant number of respondents that do live alone. And this is uh, a possible area of concern because it does uh, connect to issues around safety and social isolation. And it's especially problematic in areas that are rural in nature where some of these seniors no longer can drive due to health reasons or are isolated at night. So again, that could speak potentially to areas of concern of safety. Um, 35% of all respondents live on their own, which is higher than the Canadian average, which is about 26%. And older seniors are most often women, which could mean that potentially they would be at higher risk for health-related concerns, as I mentioned. Um, there, is so, there does ex exist some vulnerability when you're talking about the majority of seniors, which you'll find later, are still living in their homes and prefer to live in their homes, which is kind of um, consistent with the Canadian data as well. So we also asked about uh, accessibility and uh, almost one in five people who reported uh, that they did have some concerns around um, accessibility or mobility issues. Again, not surprising given the majority of respondents were over 65. Um, but what that does suggest is that one in five seniors in our communities may require some type of support to be, allow them to remain in their home and that could be possible renovations or upgrades that are needed. Uh, we asked about um, whether they own their own home or, or were, they rent, were they renting. Uh, 215 people reported that they own their own home. Uh, 41 indicated they rent and 6 were other arrangements. We didn't necessarily know what the other arrangements were, but they could be living with somebody else as a boarder or sharing uh, with a, an adult child or something like that. So for the respondents who rent, reported that they would prefer to live in another community, and they indicated uh, communities like Pedregas, Ayrshire, and Little Lands. And the reason I'm mentioning that is that um, in some communities there are no rental units. So some people are, are living in places where they may not, that may not be their first choice. So while the majority of seniors live um, in our communities own their own home and would prefer to remain in their home, this is consistent with Canadian data with over 50% of seniors living in single dwelling households. However, many have identified that it would be easier to do so if there were supports available to them in the community to help with overall regular maintenance needed and some types of financial assistance. So when we ask the question, if you rent, please re rate the affordability of your rental unit. And 38 of the renters said they can afford their rent. Um, three renters said that they can't afford their rent. We asked if they were considering selling their home. Um, 49 people indicated that they were considering selling their home. So when we asked the question about um, what they would do if they were going to sell their home, some said purchase a smaller home, some said move in with family, and 32 said that they would like to rent an apartment. And five said others, so that again could be sharing space with somebody or it even it could be moving to another community. We asked the question, do you depend on someone to help pay your rent or other costs in order to remain in your home? And 32 people reported that they depended on others to financially remain in their home. So if you put that in perspective, 262 respondents and 32 people actually would not be able to remain in their home if they didn't get financial support from others. So when we asked the question, are you able to remain in your current situation if that support was not available? 28 people said that they would not be able to remain. So 28 out of 32 said that if that support was not available, they would not be able to remain in their current home. Then we asked, would you prefer to remain in your home? And overwhelmingly, the majority said yes, they would prefer to remain in their home. Um, of those 202, um, 202 of the 262 indicated they would like to. I'm just looking at that 224 and why I've got that there. Um, I'll go back to that. I'm reported they own. Oh, of the 224 that reported they own their own home, 202 said they'd like to remain in their own home. 
So the findings of this survey support the idea that seniors in our communities prefer to remain at home, even with health cha challenges and need for additional support. Uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, we need to be mindful about what this means in terms of social isolation and how it can increase the risk, especially in rural communities. And it also suggests that outreach programs and access to ensure seniors remain connected, involved, and active are extremely important. Now, many of you may be familiar with the term aging in place. It's, um, it's a, an approach that's being used across the country. It's been kind of embraced as um, the way to go for Nova Scotia as well. And what that essentially means is let's try to keep people living in their homes and in their communities because um, that's where their preferred place to be. But this may not always be possible for people on fixed income, people living in poverty because of the costs associated with running their homes. Expenses such as insurance, electricity, and heating can be very costly for seniors who rely on only an old age pension and don't have a source of other income. So even though we may say that aging in place is the route to go, it's not often, it's not always possible for some people. Uh, as well, some of these uh, residences, these single dwelling residences are two-story. They may be old, require a considerable amount of upgrades, and may not be suitable for a senior that has health issues. And while we do know that there are grants available through the province for seniors, those are also age dependent at 65. And we have a large group of seniors in our communities that are between that age of 55 and 65 and uh, don't yet access Canada Pension. They may not even be eligible for Canada Pension because they didn't work outside the home, particularly women. And so they're not eligible for those grants. We asked a question about whether there's apartments to rent in their community. 118 reported there were apartments available, but 20 of these people also reported that while there are apartments available, there are no vacancies. There's 128 public seniors' apartments in Richmond County and Port Hawkesbury. Now, when I say public seniors' apartments, those are government apartments. As of September 2018, there were 94 people on the wait list. So do your math. We have 128, 94 on the wait list, so the chances of getting in there are pretty, re pretty remote. Many of the public housing units are older buildings. There are some buildings with accessibility limitations, so not all of them are accessible, um, such as having two floors, no elevators. In addition, there are only three motel styles that are pet friendly. Um, so the, these types of um, housing units can create barriers for seniors to live in the units. So it, there have been seniors that have declined when being called because it's either not accessible or in some cases giving up a family pet is not possible. And some people say, oh, it's just a cat or a dog, but if you're a 75-year-old senior, that could be your family member. Um, so, then we ask questions about what type of seniors housing does your community need the most? And we had really good, so got some good information from that. Um, a lot, 145 said more affordable rental housing. 109 said seniors assisted living. And when we talk about assisted living, essentially what that means is a form of supportive housing and as the care for seniors is required um, to help them with daily tasks or whatever, it's kind of a trajectory along their life so they can get support. Uh, 108 says seniors independent living, so that means a senior that's very independent and can live on their own uh, and, and don't require any support for daily living. And then 66 said um, housing persons with disability or mobility issues. So again, this, this question really provides some useful information in terms of, of the interest in more affordable housing as well as um, options for other type of housing so that they can kind of go in a progression. So they may be independent, but then as time goes on, it might require more care. And the final question that we asked, uh, which is the one that's going to be of most interest to you, is what can the municipality do to help? And um, you'll notice that 38% said that um, programs that deal with household chores, lawn care, and snow removal, 34% said more options for affordable housing, 14% said financial assistance in the forms of grants and loans, and 10% said make seniors a priority. So um, 
some of the suggestions that were made, and in, in, there were lots, lots of, this was the one question where people could provide some commentary. And there were some really good suggestions that were made, which I would suggest to you that there's an opportunity to have further dialogue with, with seniors to really get some of the ideas that they had about ways that they could um, uh, make housing kind of a more important issue, but also just make seniors' issues more important and elevate the concern given the demographic. Uh, several of them suggested that the Municipal Council could become a stronger advocate to the province to improve existing seniors' public housing units, to include elevators, advocate for internet to be one of the things that is available, advocate that some of them become pet friendly. Um, a lot of them talked about Municipal Council demonstrating stronger leadership to address issues that affect seniors. Um, several said that, you know, maybe there's a role for the municipality to look at some of these um, buildings like the Walter Fisher school and the Loosedale school to consider whether or not that's an option for um, housing as well as um, few people suggested looking at the Richmond Villa to see whether there is an opportunity to really create a campus style seniors housing development given the connection to the municipality and some type of program that really kind of helps seniors with a lot of those programs, a lot of those um, needed tasks that would help them remain in their home, like home, uh, lawn care, snow removal, walking pets, um, and other chores. So, did I fit the 15 minutes? I didn't get any waving hands or anything. So in terms of next steps, um, the Seniors Take Action Coalition are going to be um, having further discussions about this. Often when you do research and when you do a survey, the one guarantee that comes out of that is more questions, there's more questions than there are answers. So I think one of the things that this demonstrated by and large is that um, there's a much greater interest in seniors remaining in their homes, and uh, the, the challenge is how do we how do we how do we work together as a community to make it possible for seniors to do that? And what are some of the programs and services that could be offered in the community to make that feasible? Uh, there is still a need for some affordable housing, and those are going to be some of the discussions that are going to kind of take place over the coming months and hopefully the next year or two in these communities in the broader issue of housing um, so they will be presenting at the uh, port with, with Port Hawkesbury and there's going to be further discussion about is there more conversations that we need to have with seniors to get <coughs> to drill down more specifically about some of the suggestions that were made questions thank you Claire and Questions from, from councillors to Claire and or Celeste? No questions? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you, Warren. Uh, Celeste, the first slide that you had there, the head of the total population, can you explain? The bar graph on the other side because you have 65 and over at 60 percent. Is that 60 percent of the total? Or 60 that's 60 percent of, of the six? numbers. Uh, that's the numbers of seniors in that age category. So this is directly from the census data. Okay, it's 60 percent of the 46 percent of the total. Yes. Okay. The next thing you made a statement. Uh, some people aren't getting the CPP, so they don't qualify for grants. No, um, some people are may not even qualify for can, for Canada pension if they've never worked outside the home. Yeah, but that wouldn't. Uh, no, qualify. between the no between the ages of fifty five and sixty five, there's pockets of people that don't yet. They wouldn't qualify for a grant. You have to be sixty five to access it. That's, that was those were two different thoughts yeah. that I yeah, shared yeah, okay. at that time. Yeah, because I think it's the GIS. And the next, the, uh, the list that you do have there, I think it's a good suggestion about the household chores, lawn care, snow removal, but the financial assistance in the forms of loans and grants, the municipality is doing that somewhat with the septic systems to, to help seniors, you know, uh, we're going to be trying to spread that right across Richmond County, but they've been doing it on the island. Um, 
in the affordable housing, um, the affordable housing is not only for seniors. No. And we're just going to clarify that. It seems that that always kind of gets. No. Well, this this put is this is a senior group though that we're presenting on. So. Yeah, but yeah. you do mention persons with disabilities and mobility issues. Yep. But those are not only seniors. No. No. That have those issues. So, oh, of course not. No. You know, if 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 we just want to make sure that people understand that affordable housing can be for both seniors and people with disabilities and, and other challenges. Thank you for the numbers. That was very interesting. So I have a question of you, um, then, if you don't have any other questions. So does any of this information surprise you, or is it pretty much what you expected? I wouldn't say, you know, speaking for myself here, um, I don't think that I'm really surprised by this, but I do know that, you know, when the 2016 results came out, that's something that I was aware of at that time, so it's very much that information and, and you know it seems like your the projection from your data very much coincides with uh, provincial data from that time although our numbers are a little bit higher but you know um, the data pretty much speaks for itself we have over 2,000 um, aged people in Richmond County who are over the age of 65 and are experiencing all of these issues so um, you know, just like to, to comment and commend you on, on the work that was done um, by you, Celeste, but also um, the STAC for everything that they do. And I know that you're a very active group with, with a very large um, membership in your group. And, um, you know, one of the things that we have been putting together, as you're aware, is that strategic planning document. So I think that as we get those results and see, you know, what it is that, that the public is saying, taking that and, and working with maybe a smaller subgroup from STAC just to mm -hmm. see how we can work together to try to tackle some of these big problems for sure. So. Yeah, and I think one of the um, one of the opportunities, again, is the fact that the, the municipality is doing its planning process um, and uh, will be embarking upon an age-friendly plan, which an age-friendly plan, one of the, the eight tenets of an age-friendly plan is housing. So with an age-friendly plan as a, a policy framework, it would help the municipality to be able to kind of look at ways in which they could support housing. And age-friendly plan is not just about seniors, it's for the whole population. Yeah. So it's a perfect opportunity, like I say, the stars are lining up. Uh, research is coming, uh, is coming out, you're doing your planning process. There's an opportunity to do age-friendly planning and have a policy framework to guide your work and um, we're getting organized broader around housing period. So there's money um, available federally and provincially, and if we don't get organized, we're not going to be able to access it. Yeah. No, great. Thanks. Thank you all. Anybody else? Good. Mm -hmm. yeah, so uh, the number that, that was surprising to me was only the, it was 46% of people 50 <laughs> and over because I thought that number was a lot higher. Mm -hmm. I kept hearing that it was over. Mm -hmm. Oh, did I jump in? No, I, okay. I, I kept hearing that that number was like 55 and up and not eight percentage. And you're saying it's only 46. That's, that's right from the census data. Yeah. It's 46% right. 55 and up, mm -hmm. uh, 50 and up, it jumps a bit. Yeah. But we only did 55 and up for the survey, so. Thank you. Okay, Councilor Martell. Yeah, the uh, the uh, statistics are staggering. I mean, you know, you kind of think that there's issues, but I mean, this really shows that there's big issues. I guess one of the issues that I have found in uh, in working with seniors is that, you know, like even with the government subsidies to build housing, seniors can't afford to live in those in those houses. So when the proponents talk about getting subsidies from the provincial government to build them, they can't make money so they're not doing So how do we how do we manage that because they're not being done, right? The people that do live in the houses that are built now are people that can really afford it. I mean, people with teachers with pensions. So when it comes to people that if you say at, at fifty five with no kind of pension mm -hmm. and not eligible for, for old age. What do you do with those people? So this is when you have to start thinking outside the box. Um, to address housing, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to build new housing. There are all kinds of programs across the world that are looking at ways in which uh, cohabitation, we've got um, 
even in our own province, we have students living with seniors. Um, right now, we've got a student housing crisis for NSCC where students can't find appropriate housing and we have seniors living on their own that would prefer to probably have somebody in there. So there's all kinds of uh, exchanges that could be done there. There's uh, co-housing co models. There's, there's different kinds of, um, there's re re repurposing housing so that it may have two apartments so a senior could still live upstairs and then rent. So we have to think outside the box in terms of addressing the issue for sure. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you both very much. On to item five on the agenda, uh, CAO with regards to proposed committee and board reorganization. Thank you, Warden. The uh, council does have a report um, in, in front of them, and I just wanted to highlight some things before I turn it back over to the Warden for discussions. Um, this is a proposed reorganization of the Richmond County Council committees. Um, essentially, uh, <coughs> All, all uh, the committee of the whole is essentially a governance committee, and it's designed to deal with discussions and debates for all committee activity. So, in in looking at the structure of the current committees and boards, um, what we found was that uh, at the current uh, time we have 12 committees and 11 boards, which is a total of 23. Uh, which have representation of varying degrees from council members. So uh, in an effort to uh, streamline, uh, create some efficiencies and, and, uh, and improve councillors' time management, um, the proposal uh, deals with creating uh, eight committees and nine boards, uh, which is 17 rather than 23. <coughs> It would include combining the PAC and Heritage Committees, combined Wastewater and Renewable Energy Committees. The Physician Recruitment Committee would be replaced with quarterly reports uh, from and presentations to Committee of the Whole by sector professionals, advisors, and informed entities. <coughs> Policy Committee functions would be incorporated into the new Bylaw Committee. The Fire Services Association of Nova Scotia and the Fire School Board, which we do have representation, would be eliminated and rolled into the Fire Services Committee. And the Audit Committee members would be reduced from one to three, or members at large. And the EMO Committee um, uh, would report semi-annually semi as required, uh, or as required, to the Committee of the Whole. There are mandatory committees of council. There are three of them, Bylaw Committee, Audit Committee and Committee of the Whole. Um, and so uh, we looked at uh, a number of things and, and trying to balance, um, and you can see that this is strictly a draft. Um, when we proposed these committees, we uh, arbitrarily allocated um, councillors to these committees. And again, it's subject to, uh, to councillors on, on what committees they would prefer to to be on, but we tried to balance it, and you can see on the chart, on the uh, on the adjustment and realignment page, that essentially we tried to balance it so that councillors could have a an even distribution of uh, well assignments, for lack of a better word. Um, so we didn't want to <coughs> overload any particular councillor; it would be unfair. Uh, so. Um, that was the essence of, of putting this together, to try and create um, better time management for councillors, to have some balance for committee and board work, and to amalgamate committees that could be better <coughs> functioning uh, and deal with issues in a more timely fashion with combined um, combined committees. Particularly, one example would be the PAC and Heritage Committees. They are both uh, uh, go hand in hand, and the Municipal Government Act also states that PAC and Heritage Committees can be combined. So um, it's, it's a good marriage. So 
I, I throw that out as a strictly a draft document, um, and uh, so I'll turn it back to the board for uh, debate and discussion. Okay, um, so just before we do open up the floor, I, I would like to compliment the CAO and staff just on the work that was done. Um, I know this is a draft document, but it is something that's been part of our conversations around the council table for, for the last couple of years for sure, in that um, all of the committees to go along with all of the meetings. Um, there's a lot of really good stuff here with regards to um, just firming some of that up and um, possibly narrowing down some, some evening meetings and, and com combining a few things. So um, I'll go down on that. Um, and um, we'll open the floor up for some, for some discussion from council. Thank you, Warden. Uh, Kent, uh, the Fire Services Committee, I mentioned to you, I wanted to remain on that. <coughs> Maybe you got that? And uh, the Joint Development Committee, we have that on the board side. Yeah, the Joint... Someone doesn't... Uh, well, that's a, it's a commission. Um, yeah. I couldn't it's write out the whole word there. You'll see the COMM, so it, it's a commission which serves as, as like a board. But they don't even yeah. need, really. Yeah, it's rare we just that they do. We just get the report and yeah. financial statements. I don't think they've met in quite some time. Um, but yeah, so since that deals particularly with the joint industrial park with Port Hawkesbury, um, <coughs> we, we have an intermunicipal agreement uh, for that commission. Mm -hmm. So that's why it stayed. Uh, until the intermunicipal agreement is no longer exists, we pretty well have to, to keep that. Um, but to your point, it's probably appropriate to uh, reconvene a meeting just update. It hasn't met in quite some time, and it would be worthwhile to have a, a, a commission meeting just to see where everybody's yeah. heads are and what we would do. If something with that, I mean, it's only been 30 some years that yeah, I know. that's been there and nothing happening and the thing. But yeah, the fire services, I'd like to, I don't know if you only want to on it, but I'd like to remain on that one. And then the rest to me, for myself, is okay. Okay. Uh, anybody else? <coughs> maybe, maybe just to expand to, to that point as well. Um, I think some of that work, and if there is something like the Joint Development Commission that hasn't met since God knows when, um, I think the idea here is to really take some things that we may be meeting on, but taking that and putting it into an evening where we have a committee <coughs> of the whole, so that we're all being informed of whatever the information is. It's something that's happening with 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 all of council present and not just two or three members at a time. So I think it, it really does create a nice balance um, of the things that we've talked about in trying to make some change and, and moving towards that change. So any further comments? Okay, yeah. So also to go along with this draft, um, you would have noticed in your package that there were terms of reference that were put together for all of the committees, which is something that hasn't existed. So there are just going through there, you know, there's an outline, um, the mandate is stated, um, you know, how it's composed. And I know that there are, there are some uh, place to sign for confidentiality, which is a protective measure as well. So there's some really good things in there that to just help tight, tighten up and firm up some of the uh, roles and responsibilities and how our how our different um, how our different committees would operate. Councilor Mayor. Uh, y yes, I see we're by. Uh, I too, uh, Mr. Warden, would uh, congratulate the CAO and the staff for the, uh, I know there are probably people that want to be on different committees, but that means you have to give up one committee. I think we set it up whereby we try to be as fair as possible, I guess. Uh, Deputy Warden, are you thinking about giving up one committee to replace the other? So that we, it's only a draft, I don't know if that's the, No, I'm just, uh, I'll stay on the ones that I was on. That's, that's all I cared about. So I was on that one, and I would 
No, but I mean, that would extend your... Uh, oh, that, that doesn't matter. But it doesn't matter to me because you've got to take somebody off that fire services, replace it that don't think you need to. No, my question is... But it doesn't matter if there's three counselors no, I, there. Yeah, no. what the CAO is saying is that we can actually... You can increase... We can have... Yeah, okay, well, that's, yeah, yeah, there's that's no, no problem. Yeah, okay. no, there's no structure there saying that... No, no, that's all I'm saying. I, I, I don't want to penalize somebody else to get right. somebody in. Okay, thank you. Any further discussion? Councilor Martel? Yeah, I, could, I understand it's a draft, but the, uh, the section where it says it talked about reporting, there's a little bit of, uh, uh, like for example, the, the board that I'm on, the CDME, they only meet quarterly, so they don't meet monthly. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, so it's kind of, yeah. Probably an annual report, maybe, would be sufficient. sufficient yeah. 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 Or, or they could be semi annually, but I mean, it's, we don't meet monthly, we just meet every uh, quarterly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great. That's very good. Yeah. Further discussion? And maybe just to add one further point when you do look at the proposed committees and board reorganizations, there are quite a few of them there. and. Um, I know that within the last couple of years there are times where other organizations are meeting but really nothing is coming back to council and we reach a certain point where we're starting to ask some questions on what is going on with this or what is going on with that. So it might help firm up really just um, again council being more aware of some of the things that we're contributing to. So. Okay, thank you. Any um, Moving, I uh, would also maybe just before we do we'll leave the proposed committee and board of reorganization, um, this is in draft form, so nothing has been um, nothing has been changed to date. Um, but I would suggest maybe that we draft up something for our members at large currently, and mm -hmm. just make them aware that make there aware could be some changes coming. coming. Yes. Okay. okay. Very good. Uh, item six on the agenda, um, Nova Scotia Federation of um, Municipalities report. Uh, I wasn't there, but I know that we were well represented. So um, attending the conference from November 6th through 9th were Deputy Warden Marchand, Councillor Martel, Councillor Goyesh, and CAO McIntyre. Um, it was reported to me that it was a productive and informative conference, which featured interactive panel sessions and knowledgeable speakers. Um, a renowned speaker from the USA, Mr. Charles, Charles Marone, presented a keynote presentation on building strong and vibrant towns and communities and why strategic development is critical to long-term sustainable growth. Participants learned about the province's new accessibility <coughs> legislation and regulations and how they will impact municipalities. The town of Annapolis Royal described the process of how the municipality partnered with the El Sidkik First Nation to jointly plan and implement of a new amphitheater on the waterfront. Um, that sounds very familiar. Yeah, very much so. Yeah. Uh, Town of Red Hawksbury presented their startup project, which has out of the box innovation for rural growth. This town showed that when it comes to rural economic development, the status quo is no longer a viable option. Municipalities must be innovative and, when possible, partnership driven. The presentation highlighted the ability for the town to sponsor and manage a unique business startup completion, which eventually resulted in seven new business businesses opening in 2018. And representatives from Halifax demonstrated the value of the Youth Advocate Program, which has recently expanded with the full support of the City of Halifax. This community-based program is designed to increase self-reliance, resiliency, <coughs> life skills, and social skills by engaging youth in constructive behaviors with family, school, and community. About some really good things uh, that um, many of our uh, council and staff were a part of. Is there anything that. Uh, no? Good. Yeah, no. Okay. Oh, that sounds like my alarm, whatever it has. Uh, it's time, it's time to get up. <laughs> uh, next item on the agenda 6B uh, council meeting schedule. One of the um, conversations that I that I did have with the CAO recently and this is just for discussion purposes really again it's just um, it's not even something that's in draft format just something for, for council to to mull over and, and add some opinion if they wish but um, we, we discussed 
the council meetings be on a Monday night. And um, one of the things that, that um, seems to be happening more and more um, is that we do have a much heavier staff presence at our meetings, which is great because they offer a certain level of expertise and knowledge that council doesn't always have. Um, but in saying that, I know that um, you know when you when you have your Monday and you're you're busy with your job, and then Monday evenings roll around, it really makes for a long week afterwards. So um, there there's discussion and see if there's appetite among council for um, the potential of moving our council meetings to a Thursday evening. So. Um, we're not making a decision tonight, but it's just maybe an opportunity for people to, to show or, or to, to say how they feel with regards to the potential of moving from Monday evening meetings to Thursday evening meetings, and I will open the floor for discussion on that. Well, can't say I'm in favor of that. And I do want to speak about staff at the meetings. Um, as I spoke to Kent already, I'm just wondering if it's necessary all the time. Um, and what do we do? Does that mean when they're here in the evening, they're not here the next day, or part of the day, or not here the day before? Um, for meetings that we do need them, it's nice to have them for sure, but I mean, I think it's up to them if they don't feel they should be here. It's informative if they're here. Uh, but. I think maybe some of their time might be better used in the office during the day. That's why he's talking this out being here. As for Thursday evening, uh, I'm involved in, in other groups in my community, and it seems Thursday evening is the night of those meetings. So it would be a balancing act there. But whatever the, the remainder of the people want, uh, I'll, you know, not much I can say. Thank you. Okay, fair enough. Thank you, Ward. I, I agree with uh, with uh, Deputy Ward Marshall, and it is nice to have our, our staff here for questions and answers. But I also uh, feel kind of sorry for them. Uh, like you said, they, they work very hard through the week, and to come here on Monday night just to sit here to take notes and, and nobody's asking them any questions or any preference for them to be here, I think is, is a waste of their time. And, and I don't agree with uh, council meetings on Thursday night. I won't be here, I can tell you that. Oh. Council Okay. Oh. Uh, I, I mean, for me, it's, it's uh, the issues of Monday is, is a problem at time, depending, like I say, if they're, if they're going away for a weekend or something, and it's not the same for everybody, but I guess I'm retired, so it's different. But when you're away and then you need to come home Monday for, for a meeting, it's kind of, but it's going to be hard to find a day that's suitable for everybody, I'm sure, because it's always, it's always the way it is. I mean, different people have different uh, schedules and stuff, but uh, I think uh, it's something to think about and it's something to discuss. Uh, as far as the staff uh, being at the meetings, uh, I, I think I, I hear the concerns of the other counselors, but again, I think that should be uh, something that's done by management. Staff is being controlled by management. If, if the CAO feels that the people need to be at a meeting for whatever reason, I think that's a, that's a decision that CAO needs to make in that council. So, yeah. Yep. Okay. Right. Thank you. Uh, yes, Mr. Warden, I, I have no problems with uh, rescheduling meetings. I don't care if it's from Monday to Saturday or Sunday or whatever the case may be. Pretty much uses them all up. Uh, yeah, use them all up and you decide what date it is. As far as staff being available, I think we'll have the uh, agenda beforehand. I think we all know what's on the agenda. And even committee at the whole tonight, I don't see any purpose of the staff being present because there's no agents here that they have to respond to. It. I don't think I have any questions that I can ask staff tonight or anybody can ask them. So it's just a matter of reviewing what the schedule is and if there's any items dealing with uh, management, wastewater, or any kind of items that staff have to answer, then I think it's good for them to be here. But if there's nothing on the agenda, then I don't see the purpose of staff being here. But I got no problems with the meeting schedule, whatever council decides on. Uh, I'm not a, 
I went for a counselor, and I'm a counselor <coughs> seven days a week. So I got no problem. If you want. Uh, I just want one question. Why Thursday? Tuesday might be a better night, I think. It seems we've been having it on Tuesday, and it's been, everybody's been available, but why Thursday? Um, is there a reason? Just I, because, like, if, and again, like, I guess, you know, I will certainly say that this is something that I've thought about personally, but um, I, I would assume that this might relate to staff. So when, you know, when, when you have, you're going to your work and then you're going to an evening meetings on a Monday night, that does make for a long week. If that turns into a Thursday night, you really have to focus on Friday, which really, in my mind, gives you that added energy and, and just really helps um, helps get you through the week when you know that there's only that one one extra day of work the following day. So, it, like you know, it's not. Do I have personal interest in this? Absolutely, but that's <coughs> the reason why I brought it up. So uh, I'm. On board with everybody else on this, but whatever works for the majority of council and whatever we go with is is fine by me for sure. I I think uh, I think uh, we're inclined. That that's a discussion for council to sit down the five councillors and decide to. to Absolutely. This is the same as uh, making a schedule for meetings. That's council's decision. That's not the CAO's decision or anybody else's. Whatever committees you go on, that's council's decision. further discussion okay no thank you for your input and it's something that we will ask council discuss for sure <coughs> item seven um, correspondence action required so in your package you would have, there were three separate grants um, that were processed and brought to council through Director of Finance. Um, Jason, is there anything that you wanted to add to that? Or? Uh, I, I can if council wishes, and I'll trust it's fine. So, <laughs> we did bring you here, so you might as well. You're going to know tonight, Jason. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Mr. Warden. Okay, so uh, thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, I knew that's right. Yeah, that's why. That's why you said that. Um, so the first grant on the list is a grant for the Richmond County uh, Seniors Council. Uh, it's a Type 3 C3 sponsorship grant. Uh, this organization is looking for uh, a contribution of $500. And it's for a seniors event that is uh, involving uh, Richmond County wide. It's not one particular area in the county. Um, the event is going to have a multitude of guest speakers, I guess, including the president of the Nova Scotia Federation of Seniors and Pensioners. Uh, what they're doing is they're having guest speakers and they're also doing a meal slash dance. The total budget for the event is $5,275. Uh, you will note, like I just said, that the grant is being is that the grant is being applied for through the recreation type 3 C3. But staff, uh, if council has an appetite to approve this grant, staff is recommending that it be approved through the activity type 2 grant funding. Um, because my understanding is that it's not a recreational event, it's a senior event. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we will change uh, from type 3 C3 to a type 2 activity sponsorship grant? Yeah. Or activity grant, sorry. Activity grant. Yeah. All good? I'll move we do that. Okay. Okay. It's been moved by Councillor Boucher that um, Council accept the recommendation from the CFO with regards to the $500 request to a type 2 activity grant. Seconder, seconder by Councillor Martel. Discussion? Questions. Questions been called. All those in favor, signify by raising your right hand. Mm -hmm. Motion carried. You want to approve the grant? No? 
Yeah. So approved yeah, individually or individually? Uh, I think we, we just did the one, so we'll just continue on with, with individually. Yeah. Uh, CFO, I'll turn it back to you. We're thank making you work hard tonight. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Warden. Uh, the next grant on the list is a uh, grant request from the River Bourgeois Mariner Society. It's a Type 2 activity grant request. This group is looking for a contribution of $450. Um, and this group is putting on a fish chowder uh, luncheon event. Um, it's part of Richmond County. It's going to be part of Richmond County Winterfest. And the proceeds used uh, are going to go towards upkeep and improvements on the society's docks and building located at 166 Northside Road in River Bourgeois. Uh, and that's all I'll say on that. <coughs> Now the move we accept the, uh, the grant. Mm -hmm. the River Bourgeois Mariner Society. Okay, it's been moved by Councillor Boucher that we accept the River Bourgeois Mariner Society Type 2 Activity Grant in the amount of $450, seconded by Deputy Warden Marshall. Uh, discussion? Question. Question has been called. All those in favor signify by raising your right hand. Motion carried. Back to the CFO. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Uh, the next grant on the list is a grant request from the Richmond County Early Childhood Education Association. And that's for a uh, Type 2 activity grant. The group is seeking a contribution of $500 and it's to go towards their Christmas Bonanza. And the Christmas Bonanza um, will entail a craft market, a lunch, a big sale, entertainment during the day, a silent auction, and I'm being told that Santa Claus will also be making an appearance. And that event is scheduled to be November 17th at the Disclose Civic Improvement Hall. Yeah. So, okay, it's been moved by Councillor Martel that uh, Council accept a recommendation from the CFO for um, Richmond County Early Second. Child Education Association Type 2 Activity Grant Fund in the, in the amount of $500, as seconded by Councillor Gayesh. Discussion? Question. Question's been called. All those in favor, signify by raising your right hand. Here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, item number eight on the agenda: review of checks issued. Everybody has received a copy of that. And if there are any um, any issues with regards to the checks, um, they can they can notify myself and or staff. Um, next item is items added to the agenda. Um, Deputy Warden grants issues. Um, so I will turn the floor over to you and you can okay, thank elaborate you. on that. Um, <clears throat> at our last meeting, we had approved a grant and I see there was a thank you note from that organization. And uh, I spoke with the CAO about it and as all of you are aware, I sent an email out. Um, it's very clear that the organization applying needs to, especially the infrastructure, needs to control and own the assets. <coughs> and that's not the case with this one. And it's not that I don't want them getting the grant. Um, there's also in our policy the financial need, that question, you know, does the organization need such a grant? I mean, one of the grants this evening, there was, there was a considerable amount of assets there as well. So the whole grant structure, <coughs> the one this evening for the Richmond County seniors, they were forced to, as you can see, I think they just applied in, in April or May, to get uh, the registry of joint stocks. They could normally apply for this through one of the other seniors that are paying for it. I mean, that's a forty to fifty dollar cost for them. So, if we're making some organizations follow the rules, I think we need to. And this is no, you know, no shot on staff or, or any of us for applying, for uh, approving any of these grants. But I think we really need to review it, and uh, it just seems to be we're we're going down the path of approving some, uh, having discussions of what's infrastructure, what's not infrastructure. We're not approving some in that field and approving others. So I just think we need to uh, clarify what some of these things are and be consistent with it, uh, with the grants. <coughs> that's, that's all I really want to say about it moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Comments? Um, item 10. 15 minute question period, so I will now ask if anybody in the audience would like to approach the mic. 
Um, again, we will ask that if anybody does come for question period, please make it relevant to the agenda for this evening's meeting. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, my name is Richard Cotton, and I'm from District Three. Three. Thank you. <laughs> I think it was that Brian. Uh, yeah, I, I have a, a couple of questions. One is in the, the uh, proposed committee and board for the organization. Now, I might have missed that. Uh, one of them, but what about the police commission? I mean, that's mandated, I think, by the Municipal Government Act, so I'm just. Did I miss it, or was it not included? No, it's there. Yeah. It's there. It's Good. It's there. Okay. The um, the second one then is the uh, the audit committee. I know in 2016, uh, council this is after the election, the council appointed uh, three members to the audit committee. And this will government act only mandates that one. Some units have done two. I think we're down to two now because the, one of the appointees um, never did attend a meeting and, and actually sent a letter in stating that they didn't wish to be part of the audit committee. Um, when CEO McIntyre stated it, he said from one to three, maybe he meant from three to one, or is it just... Oh, sorry, yeah, three to one. <laughs> All right, just, well, just he, check. It, so. He said one from three. Yeah, he did. Did he strum? Yeah, oh, exactly. My hair, I'm getting older, Brian. My hair is not the best anymore. One, one last one. Um, for information purposes, uh, I know you put on the agenda, and I know council allows has a copy of it, but the listening audience don't, and also people in here don't. So it would be good if those letters were actually read uh, so that the public would be informed of what they were. So I'm assuming that Cole before actually gave permission for accessibility on that, but you know, uh, nobody knows that except the councillors and the staff. Just, to, just for a future yeah, going ahead. Yeah, no, okay. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. Any further questions from the audience? No. I think that's an old for the words that should be read close. Um, is that the letter the letter from the call book form? Yeah. Yeah, that's not on the agenda. I just I kind of spoke of it. No, no, it, it is. No, no, no. It's on the agenda. Oh, is it? Yeah. 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 Yeah, totally. Just yes, I, I, and I, I actually will read it out. But it's not on the one I have. Is it on yours? Yeah. It's, it's on the computer. I, I saw it there, but there's no number attached to it. It's a printed one. Oh. What number is it? There is no number. No, I think maybe it, it was in the email package that we received, it was, but it yeah. may not have made it to the actual paper copy. Yeah, that's exactly right. Well, I think it's no problem. No, I, and, I, and I will read it, but yeah. we'll continue on with the 15-minute question period. Thank you. Do you want me to read it, Jason? No, 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 that's okay. okay. That's where you go. What remains of it? Oh, okay. Because we may not be have it here. It was in the Hi, I'm Jermaine McDonald from St. Peter's. Uh, just one question, and it has to do with the question period. Sure. Is I'm um, just um, very curious as to why, after two years of the, the public being able to ask any questions, that we're now back to only um, asking questions about what's on the agenda. Um, and that, that was actually something that the five councillors had discussed um, probably about three weeks ago. Um, and that, um, you know, for a while, I think mm -hmm. that. Council felt that with everything that had been going on before, that people needed um, an avenue to, to basically get out, um, get some questions that they may have had, some burning questions, and, and move forward. But I think after um, two years, what Council had decided was that we really wanted to get back to um, having questions brought up that were strictly um, on the agenda. And, and just prior to that, we did have some people approach Council um, and, and, and I'm not going to suggest that they're wasting time, but they're coming in and talking to council about an issue that had already been resolved. So it just really kind of turned into an information session, which I don't really think that question period is, that's what it's for. Um, I think that if people are here to ask questions about that meeting, 
um, then that's what question period is for. But if there is anything outside of what's on the agenda, certainly they can reach out to myself and or any other councillors within their districts, and we'll you know we'll do our best to answer any questions that you have. Okay, thank you. Sure. Anything else? Great. Oh yes, sorry. I will read the uh, the letter um, that uh, Mr. Cotton suggested that we do. So, dear Mr. McIntyre, the principal, staff, students, and community of the Colbo Corps would like to thank you for your financial donation of five thousand dollars for the fence, which will enclose a new new natural playground for children up to the age of eight. This financial help will permit us to offer more space for our children to play in a secure environment. Also, the communi community can utilize our playground since it's available for our community after school hours. We appreciate that this amount will be used for social development for our young students and will also benefit the whole community. Sincerely, Jacinta Sampson Sullivan, Principal of the Cobble Board. Uh, Councillor Boucher, move to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. And seconded by Councillor Martel. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you. No.